You can go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So, uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, Legacy IT Europe session uh, from Raincode. Uh, so my name is Marcus Lindstrom. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Raincode and I'll be uh, presenting our approach to uh, migrating mainframes to uh, cloud native environments. Um, so let's see here. First of all, I think it's important that we define what we mean by cloud native. Uh, there's not necessarily just one uh, definition. There, there are a few uh, key elements that we usually hear when we talk about cloud native as opposed to just the cloud. Um, so it's really an approach in software development which intends to leverage uh, the capabilities, the, I mean, the inherent capabilities of the cloud to build uh, scalable applications, um, which re usually rely on open technologies such as containers, uh, microservices, serverless functions, and immutable uh, infrastructure, which is deployed with uh, declarative code, uh, mostly. And this uh, really gives us a flexible environment where you can, first of all, you can scale up and scale down the resources that you need. And it also allows you to actually make changes uh, in a very controlled manner uh, on this environment by doing rolling updates and so forth, which really allows you to give a much more agile approach to the way you, you work with, uh, with code in general and with legacy code in particular, as we'll, we'll uh, see. So let's take a deep dive inside what we actually have within a mainframe, because the idea here is really to be able to put uh, the mainframe, so to speak, onto the cloud. So we're going to discuss briefly how we, we actually go about doing this. So um, what we have inside a mainframe uh, is actually, first of all, uh, the obvious, obviously, which is um, the, the business logic that you have in your application. So you, you may have a banking back office system, an insurance back office system, and so forth, which are really uh, heavy lifters within this mainframe. That's a business logic that actually has uh, the added value of your business. But that's not all. Obviously, within the mainframe, you have a lot of other systems within this um, ecosystem. You have uh, things such as uh, security systems, you have uh, messaging systems, you have a scheduler, you have a transaction management system, and other components which are really a part of this whole environment and that your applications uh, rely on. The initial um, structure that we start with uh, usually is so a mainframe system. So what, what do we usually have on a mainframe system? Well, we often have uh, a Kix system. So we have Kix applications, which are sometimes using uh, 3270 uh, screens, so terminal screens to actually access and uh, interact with your application. Then we got business logic. For example, in a bank, we can imagine that we have a program that allows you to see the balance of an account that can be written in a legacy language such as COBOL. Uh, you can have a payment application that's uh, written in a language such as PL1. Um, you will most often obviously have a DB2 database uh, on the mainframe as well. So all these applications interact with DB2. And of course, you also usually have batch jobs which are written in JCL. So this is kind of the starting point that we have. This is what we usually see on mainframes. Uh, we have these kinds of structures. So what do we actually do uh, to put these applications on the cloud? Well, we're actually going to take out the application logic, which is really the COBOL and PL1 code and even the high-level assembler code that you might have, uh, and put them uh, into boxes. What we mean by this is that we're actually going to run them with the rain code compilers. So we're going to run this code through our compilers. And this will actually provide you with uh, .NET Core assemblies. And .NET Core assemblies can run on basically anything. It can run on Linux, it can run on Windows, uh, so forth. And we put those into uh, standard containers. So uh, it can be Docker, it can be any OCI uh, container runtime, really. Um, but I put Docker here because that's, that's the term most people are familiar with. Uh, so we wrap that logic inside Docker containers, and we expose it as a microservice with a simple uh, HTTP layer. And then uh, what, we, what we will do and what, what I will actually show you in the demo a bit later is that we use a technology called Dapper, uh, which is um, a project that's been pushed by Microsoft. They started it a year ago and we, we've used it for our demos, but it, it's by no means the only way to do this, uh, just to underline that. Um, what we do then is that we take these, um, these microservices and we put them on a cluster, so on a Kubernetes cluster usually. Um, we can connect those containers to a common data source. So for example, the SQL Server database on the cloud as well. And then we can write a front end 
in another language, such as Python, for example, which is what we'll have in this demo. And at that point, we can have customers connecting to this new front end. And when this front end needs to request, for example, a balance or create a payment, it will actually call uh, these services, these other containers, these other microservices uh, through this uh, Dapper layer. And uh, at that point, uh, we can have other th nice things such as having the balance program actually uh, connect to an Azure Key Vault to get the credentials for the database uh, and other things uh, like this. So Dapper actually provides a framework to do this kind of easily. But as I said, again, uh, Dapper is by no means the only way of doing this. It's just uh, a quite easy way to set up uh, and welding these microservices together. So what this allows us to do is that we can put the business logic into microservices, and this really opens a world for uh, consumption by modern languages. So it can be Python, JavaScript, Java, but actually it can be any language that supports HTTP clients. So if you can call an HTTP service, you can basically uh, make use of these microservices. So I'm gonna do uh, a demo. I'm gonna show you uh, basically this whole scenario. So where we go from this uh, 3270 um, screen-based application to uh, an HTTP-based front-end. Um, and I'm gonna show this is in an environment which I'll, I'll cover a bit later uh, in this talk as well, which is called Rainco 360, which is actually available free of charge on Azure Marketplace. Um, so anyone with an Azure account can use this. And Rainco 360, uh, as I'll explain, is basically an environment that contains all of these demos. So everything I'm gonna show you here can be uh, tried for yourself on Azure. So I'll just change to um, the demo environment here. So I hope that you can see it. So, our starting point is obviously, as I said, a Kix application. So what we have here is actually uh, a bank demo, that, a bank application demo that we've written uh, that's available on, on 360 here. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we have a Kix application. So just to make things clear here, what you're actually seeing is a 3270 emulator, obviously. What's actually running behind here is .NET assembly. So we've taken our bank application, which is written in COBOL and PL1, uh, we've run it through our compilers, so we get .NET assemblies that are currently on this Windows platform now. Uh, and then we put all of that together inside the Renko Kick Simulator. So we actually have a complete uh, Kick Simulation layer here, which allows us to get these uh, 3270 screens because we have a terminal server amongst uh, the other components. And so this is basically uh, a very standard um, 3270 kind of application. So for example, we, we have the usual uh, filtering fields. I can filter on the zip code, for example. I can filter uh, on the last name. Uh, so kind of run-of-the-mill uh, things that you see on mainframe. And for example, I can dig into uh, one of the customers here. Uh, I can check, for example, the state of, of one of these accounts. And we can see here that we have uh, some transactions for this customer. Okay. So um, this is really the starting point. So we have legacy code running here that's been compiled and running on our .NET runtime uh, and that we can access through this terminal server. So we, we have this whole Kix application. And what we've done is that we've taken uh, the business logic. So we've taken, for example, a program that gives you the list of accounts, the program that gives you uh, the balance of an account, uh, something that gives you a list of customers. We've wrapped those uh, in an automatic manner as a microservice that we can then uh, consume uh, through this, for example, this web front end that you're seeing. So what, what you're seeing here is a front end that's been written uh, using Python. Uh, it's, it's a Django framework for those who are, who are uh, knowledgeable about that. And basically, okay, so we have something that just consumes these services through a very simple JSON interface, which is what you would expect in these kinds of uh, microservice environments. So for example, uh, I have a, a simple account balance program here that I can call. I can see uh, get account balance. And by clicking here, you can see that I get the account balance for the account, 68528. And actually, if I go to uh, the Kix application here, we can see that that's the, the actual balance that I have for this account. So it all matches up because obviously they use the same data source, which is kind of the whole point. Um, I can create a transaction as well. So uh, let's uh, create a transaction so that I want to, uh, for example, uh, do a transfer of uh, 123.45 and I'll call it, uh, live, for example, live demo, uh, and I do the transfer here. So this will actually get in touch with uh, the payment program. 
And you can see that it, it will tell me that, okay, I've created uh, this transaction. I had this amount on the account before. This is the new amount I have on the account. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's see what happens in the Kix application. If I just go back here and go back into the account, well, you can see that the uh, live demo transaction I just created is, is here. So uh, it, we've really been running the same program here. So it's the same legacy code that's been running and creating this transaction. Um, and you can see that the, um, the account balance also matches up. Um, and then, for example, we have another uh, simple uh, application here, which is looking up the list of customers. Uh, for, so you can see that I get a list of customers here. And in fact, this is the very same logic uh, that's used um, when doing a search here. So I, I looked up all the customers that started with WE. Uh, well, basically, I do the same here. And you can see that I get the same list. Well, actually, it's the same list. But uh, as you can see what, on the new front end, I can actually order them a bit differently. Uh, on the mainframe, they were ordered by uh, ID. I've chosen to order them by last name and first name, for example. So you can uh, just things up. Obviously, you get the same data back from the application, and you can choose whatever you want to do with it on your front end. So this is really um, the approach that we have. So, And another important thing uh, is that you can actually get some insight into what your application is doing on the cloud. It's more difficult, obviously, than on a monolithic mainframe to know what your system is doing. But fortunately, there are a lot of tools on cloud native platforms. And uh, for example, we're going to show here uh, one of the tools that you could get on Azure, uh, which is really um, that's something that's called Application Insights. So one of the reasons we use this Dapper framework that I mentioned earlier is that it out of the box gives you the ability to integrate with uh, tracing tools such as this one. Um, and what we can see here is that uh, this application insight um, system has managed to see the components. It, it's managed to see, uh, it's collected information from Dapper and it's built a kind of a component graph uh, of the application. So what we can see here is that it's figured out that we have a front end that's written in Python here. So that's the name I've given to this component. And we can see the other backend services, the microservices that we're consuming. So we have a customer list service, an account list service, uh, a balance service, and a payment service. And you can get a lot of insights here. Uh, for example, if you click on an arc, you can get some information about the performance of the calls that are made between these services uh, and so forth. I'm not going to go into all the details of application insights here, obviously. There are other uh, frameworks to do this as well. So application insights on Azure is just one way of doing this. There are other packages that allows you to uh, uh, get this kind of information and plot it into whatever uh, form of information you want. So. If we go back to um, uh, the slides, one of the important things um, that I couldn't really show you during the course of this demo, but it's important to know, is that the interfaces that are made to actually integrate, so to, to integrate with these microservices, are actually built in an automatic manner. Uh, so for example, um, the, the account balance uh, program, uh, it's a COBOL program, that relies on uh, something like this. So it relies on a, on a com area structure, and we map it onto a COBOL structure, which uses these fields, uh, account number, amount. And in fact, uh, on an automatic manner, we, we convert this into a JSON interface. Um, so our front end basically requests, sends this JSON request to the service. And as you can see, it matches up pretty much exactly with what you see in the COBOL structure. So we have C007 and the account number. Uh, we give that in a JSON structure. We send it to the microservice. And what we're going to get back is actually more or less the same structure with the added information of the amount uh, that was uh, calculated by the program itself. So basically, if you, you know uh, the structure, the semantics of the structure that you have in your program, you'll see that the JSON structure lines up perfectly. And this basically allows you to um, use your program, your legacy program, as it was, because you know the interface uh, that you need to use to communicate with it, you use the same in JSON, uh, and, and it basically just works. Um, and an important thing as well is that our approach is really to give you uh, the ability to be DevOps ready. What we mean by this is that since we use um, cloud-native technologies, it really lines up well with this kind of approach where you can have a developer that's working on the code uh, using, using Visual Studio. I will go a bit into that as well uh, as we go on here. Um, so you can use Visual Studio with the Raincode integration, uh, which I'll, I will show shortly. 
um, to actually write and work on your legacy code. Uh, then you can uh, push the, the changes to a pipeline. So it can be Jenkins, it can be an Azure DevOps pipeline. Uh, you have obviously several solutions here as well. We then provide uh, Docker images with our compilers and our runtimes that allow you to really put them into a pipeline and build the programs as they are changed. We can deploy uh, the resulting components of the containers onto uh, a Kubernetes cluster. And in this case, so we get, for example, a, a container containing everything you need for a given case transaction. So we put all the dependencies in, a, in the same box, so to speak. Um, and we also do the same uh, for batches, which allows us to call um, the case transactions as HTTP microservices, which is what I illustrated during the demo. And for batches, uh, we can also uh, use a scheduler, any kind of scheduler. Obviously, you're not going to have HTTP calls in this case. It's probably uh, going to be more queue-based. It makes a lot more sense for long-running jobs. Uh, but the idea of boxing and putting all the components together in the container boxes is still the same. And then obviously, as you're in a cloud environment, uh, you can connect all of these to the same database on, uh, on Azure SQL, for example. And you can connect them to storage as well. So you have Azure storage that you use, for example, an Azure ecosystem to uh, store uh, all the results of your JCL batches. So we've talked about cloud native. Uh, I've given you uh, a quick tour of what we do. Um, and now we're going to talk a bit about who we are, uh, for those who are not familiar with, uh, with Raincode, what we actually offer beyond this, uh, and discuss a bit uh, customers and projects that we, that we have. And then we'll conclude uh, and allow you to ask any questions, obviously. So we were a company that are, that's founded in Brussels, Belgium uh, in 1998. So we're just over 20 years old now. Uh, we're about 65 people working here um, and we're completely privately owned. So there's no uh, venture capital involved here. Um, and we really have one core mission, which is providing compilers and other tools to uh, migrate IBM mainframes to .NET, .NET Core, and Azure. Um, and as, a, as kind of a testimonial to, to the kind of innovative stuff we do uh, is that we've gotten three Microsoft Technical Achievement Awards uh, over the years. So I really want to insist that they're not sales awards, they're really technical innovation awards uh, that kind of go to show that we, we, we use their technologies in a very innovative way and really helped uh, customers move uh, forward thanks to this. And, uh, and we're also a gold partner with Microsoft, which is uh, why obviously you'll see us doing a lot of stuff on Azure because that's kind of natural given our position. Um, so what we offer is actually a, a whole suite of products uh, to fulfill this mission. Uh, so we, we provide the obvious COBOL and PL1 compilers, which is what we used in the demo. Also the kick simulator that you saw. So uh, we have a full kick simulator system with a terminal server and so forth. Uh, but we also have other uh, tools and other uh, products. We have an ASM 370 compiler. So actually if you have sources written in high level assembler, uh, we can compile them and run them on .NET as well. And they will integrate just as well with uh, your other COBOL and PL1 programs. We have a JCL interpreter. Uh, so this is a product we call Raincode Batch. Uh, so that's really used for uh, JCL batches and allows you to run them uh, on any platform outside of the mainframe. And we also have an IMS simulator, uh, which supports both the database side, so IMS DB and the transaction monitor, which is IMS DC. So both of those components are supported uh, in the emulator. I'm not gonna go into this here because it's a whole uh, can of worms. It's a massive subject. Uh, if you're interested in the IMS part of things, uh, we can obviously discuss uh, doing other uh, talks about it at a later date. Um, and all of these products target um, .NET, so the .NET framework, uh, .NET Core, and Azure. Um, and .NET Core is, of course, of specific interest to uh, the cloud native world because .NET Core can run on Linux, and thus you can run it basically on any kind of container, which is, uh, of course, an important thing here. And we also uh, have integration with Visual Studio, which I'll, I'll get back to. So what you've seen here is really the COBOL, PL1 compilers, and the Kick Simulator. And so these other products we, we haven't shown uh, during this demo. So um, let's talk a bit about uh, some of our customers and what we've done with them. So one of the important cases we've worked on recently is MBank. So MBank is a Polish uh, retail bank that's owned by Commerzbank. 
uh, which was launched as a, as a Greenfield venture in, in November 2000. So they're just about to turn 20. Uh, happy birthday to them. <laughs> and they're, they're today the third largest retail bank in Poland. So it's quite a massive operation. Um, and they've had a long-standing partnership with Accenture, uh, especially because the, they were using uh, the Alnova COBOL banking package. Uh, so it's, it's a COBOL-based banking package that does most of the, uh, the business. And so their, their BMS, so the 3270 screens, uh, have been bypassed, uh, and they, they've moved to a web and mobile uh, user interface. And really, the motivation they had for re-hosting, uh, so really to leave the mainframe, uh, was the unsustainable volume increase of their business. Uh, th they had uh, over 2,000 transactions per second, and it was growing, and they were really uh, struggling to keep up with the uh, monolithic mainframe hardware. And they really needed the flexibility to scale up resources as needed. Uh, and they also ran into staffing problems because, um, well, as you probably all know, getting people knowledgeable in COBOL and PL1 and these legacy languages becomes harder as time goes on. Uh, so they obviously wanted to open up um, their uh, business logic to be able to be used with new uh, modern languages. So for those who are interested, there's a link here uh, to an interview with Christoph Dabrowski from MBank, who discusses kind of the problems and the issues they, they faced when doing this. Um, so why do we do legacy compilers, actually? Uh, what's our whole uh, idea here? Well, we really work with a fundamental assumption that we call the, the single source dogma, which is central to the way we work. The idea is really that we want you to be able to use the same legacy code on the mainframe as on other platforms on .NET in particular in our case. We don't want you to have to change a single line of legacy code. So we want you to be able to compile uh, existing portfolios rather than developing uh, new code uh, if we don't need to. And usually we don't need to. And this also opens up the possibility of integrating your business logic with modern languages, which allows you to then evolve your code uh, in a positive direction. And as far as these legacy languages are concerned, so ASM, PL1, COBOL, and JCL, we really work with a central tenet as well, which is that equivalence is more important than correctness. And what we mean by this is that uh, obviously customers run these programs on their mainframes, and they're usually compiled with quite old versions of the compilers because, well, they've been running very well since the 80s. There's no reason to recompile them. Uh, that's perfectly understandable. Um, but the problem is that older compilers from IBM actually had bugs that didn't really follow uh, the spec precisely. They, they had some quirks. Uh, and we want to make sure that your code behaves the same without having to change it because you're actually relying on a bug from IBM without necessarily knowing it. So our compilers really uh, and make sure that they actually mimic actual bugs from the IBM compilers. So we really keep the same behavior because we, we believe that this equivalence is more important than actually following the norms. Um, so as far as main, uh, mainframe language support uh, goes, we really target IBM dialects uh, mostly because uh, our main business is really helping you get off IBM mainframes. We also have a few other extensions that are supported by the compilers, a few microfocus ones, for example. Uh, but it's mostly IBM specific stuff. And we also have built in support for Kix and SQL. Uh, well, Kix you've seen, uh, obviously, uh, and SQL uh, works as well. So we have inline SQL that works just fine. And we really aim for accurate mainframe emulation. So we have an EBC deck mode that's available. What this means is that when we store data, we write it as the mainframe would expect with the correct NGNS and the ABC deck um, encoding as well, which allows you to write write files, sorry, um, that can then be used by a legacy mainframe program without any issues. And we also support exception handling, mainframe style, uh, which is not an easy thing to do, uh, but it's something that we emulate as well. So NGNS I mentioned as well. So uh, if there's an NGNS difference between your systems, uh, it will work just fine. Um, and we also go as far as having intermediate value arithmetic with bit level precision. So we really aim to uh, have as much an accurate mainframe emulation as possible, even uh, when, as far as computation goes. So the Visual Studio integration uh, we mentioned, I can uh, show this quickly. Um, we actually have a plugin uh, in Visual Studio that gives you uh, a, an environment, a development environment for legacy, for legacy code. So you have syntax highlighting for COBOL, ASM, PL1. 
Uh, you can use breakpoints with an integrated debugger. Uh, so we actually uh, connect with the Visual Studio debugger, uh, which allows you to see, for example, values just as you would in any uh, C Sharp or C++ program when you work with Visual Studio. And we really aim to transpose this whole Visual Studio uh, experience to uh, the legacy languages. And as a matter of course, I can uh, show this to you. Uh, I'm actually going to well, I'm just gonna show this here. Uh, sorry. Um, so this is really the experience that you get. So this is actually the source code that we use for the bank banking demo and that's available on, on Rayco 360. Uh, so you can see that uh, we have uh, syntax highlighting. I'm not gonna go into everything. One of the nice things is that you can even see that SQL code is uh, parsed correctly as well. So you can actually see it colored uh, as a distinct uh, kind of syntax here. And it also allows me to actually segue into another feature that we have. So uh, as we say, we don't want you to change the code, even though you might, for example, migrate from DB2 to SQL Server. Uh, so you can leave your DB2 SQL as it is, uh, because our compilers will actually, as you can see here when I highlight with the tooltip, convert at compile time the DB2 uh, queries to SQL Server queries, which allows you to seamlessly integrate DB2 queries with a SQL Server um, system. So to, to go back to um, uh, my slides here, let's see, here we go. Um, this is not trivial. This is not a trivial problem to actually convert these SQL, uh, SQL dialects uh, from one to the other. Um, so what we really do is that we, we parse the DB2 uh, queries and we rewrite them um, use, using the SQL Server dialect. So for example, if you have a, a fetch first only clause in your, um, in your DB2 query, we convert that to a top one uh, clause in SQL Server. If you have with uh, unread, uh, uncommitted reads uh, on DB2, we, we convert that to with uh, read uncommitted on SQL Server. And if you have uh, a date here, for example, today that I want to use for a comparison, we also insert uh, the conversions to the input parameters as needed. And this is all done at compile time. So there's no performance penalty at runtime. And in fact, what we do is that we put both flavors of the queries in the compiled module. So uh, at runtime, you can choose if you want to connect to a DB2 uh, data source or a SQL Server data source, and the compiled module will just use the correct query as needed. Uh, another word about the customers and projects uh, that we have. Um, so really our, custo our customer base is large mainframe users. Uh, so SDC, for example, is uh, a massive back office operation behind a lot of Scandinavian banks. So a lot of transactions are going through there. Um, so that was a massive project and uh, they managed to cut costs on their operational expenses by, uh, by as much as 70 or 80%, uh, I believe. Top Denmark uh, is a large insurance company in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, Pulsen is an omnichannel uh, solutions provider for a lot of Scandinavian entities as well. MBank, we already mentioned. Uh, CSSZ uh, is a social security institution in uh, the Czech Republic. So that's also a, a big mainframe user. And Volvo, uh, which I'll discuss a bit more uh, in the coming slide. We have other references as well. If you really want to get more information about the case studies, about what we did with the, all of these customers, uh, I invite you to go to our website, uh, raincode.com, uh, which really goes into details about what we've done with all of these customers and how we've helped them move off the mainframe. Um, so the case of Volvo cars is actually uh, interesting as well. Um, the idea was really to migrate a massive workload from uh, the mainframe to the cloud. Um, I'm not gonna be, uh, insult your intelligence by presenting what Volvo is. I think we all know uh, who Volvo is. Um, uh, so really the case here was a system, a software system that computed the CO2 impact of car configurations. And in fact, the problem was that a new European regulation came into force, which forced them to uh, basically multiply their workload by a hundred uh, and to be available 24 seven. They could not have any downtime on this software anymore. They couldn't change the COBOL source code because it worked just fine. They didn't, we didn't want to change that. Um, and we had to move to SQL Server because we chose to move to Azure uh, in this case. So it was quite natural to move to SQL Server database. So we have a replica of the mainframe database that's actually running on SQL Server. Um, and we use Raincode's compile time SQL dialect translation that I explained earlier to just use the same COBOL sources using DB2 queries, but actually 
running on SQL Server instead. Um, so we moved the system to Azure. Uh, we use Service Fabric. So as I mentioned, there are several solutions to go into the cloud. Uh, I showed Dapper earlier, which is one way of welding things together. You, you have Service Fabric, you have Azure Functions, there are a lot of ways of doing this. Um, so we use Service Fabric in this case because it was uh, a good fit for the scalability issues that we faced. And then it now allows them to have over 100 car configurations checked per second uh, with over a million web transactions every 24 hours just doing these CO2 calculations. So um, it's really a massive operation and having this resource scalability available on the cloud is uh, really, uh, really useful to actually make sure that they don't waste money on having too many resources when they don't need it and scale them up and scale them down uh, as they uh, need to. So really moving to the cloud, uh, moving to cloud native platforms is more uh, than your usual replatforming, uh, because the idea is that you can really translate these trans kicks transactions and batch jobs at scale on these platforms and scale them up and scale them down as you need to. And the way Rainco does this is really by relying on state of the art cloud native technologies. So we use .NET Core because that works on anything. Basically, if it runs on Linux, so you can basically run it on anything. We use Docker or OCI containers, if you prefer, which is an industry standard for containerizing applications. And Kubernetes, which is kind of a natural fit for uh, scalability uh, issues. And this allows you to really get rid of antiquated infrastructure because you can move away from the mainframe uh, in a progressive manner. Uh, actually, since we, you can integrate your old legacy code uh, with uh, new code, it really allows you to do this in a phased manner. Uh, you, you can actually do this uh, progressively. You can keep the mainframe running and move some stuff onto the cloud and keep them interacting. And then you can really move stuff out of the mainframe uh, as you go along without having to go big bang. You can really do this in a progressive incremental manner and uh, it will work just fine. And so it really allows you to have easy consumption by applications written in modern languages. So historically, um, the Raincode solution built .NET assemblies, and this allowed you to integrate with C Sharp, PB.NET, F Sharp, .NET languages. But because you can now have these HTTP uh, microservices instead, it really allows you to connect with anything, anything that has an HTTP uh, client available. So it can be a Node.js, it can be uh, Java, it can be basically any uh, technology because now we just have an HTTP layer to connect all of these services together. And we believe that this allows you to fulfill the promise of digital transformation, really take your business to the next age. I mentioned that Raycode 360, which I showed for the demos, is available on Azure Marketplace. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of what's in there. It's really a technical showcase of everything we have to offer. So all the demos that I've shown here and lots of other demos are available there. Uh, it gives you a panorama of the whole Raincode product suite. It's complete in the sense that you get the source code of all these demos uh, and development projects for Visual Studio. You get a short-term test license as well. So you can use our products free of charge to uh, test all, all of their functionalities. You can try it with your own code as well. Uh, so you can really take some legacy code off your mainframes and try to run it on there. And one of the tools we actually provide, um, which I won't dive into here, but it, it's, a, it's a topic of discussion in itself. It's another tool called Raincode Insight, which is provided with 360, which we use as a code-based migration assessment tool. So you can act, we can actually put uh, your portfolio onto 360 run this tool and get an idea of uh, what we can do with your code base, how, how much needs to be fixed, for example, uh, so that they, they, they work uh, with our compilers. For example, you have some proprietary quirk, uh, an extension of the language that we don't support yet. Um, and, um, and this really gives us a very good overview of how your portfolio looks, what's in there, uh, the dependencies and so forth. And it really allows us to target specific things that we can migrate easily. So that's it for me. Uh, that's really uh, all I have to say during this uh, session. Uh, so if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, I'll, uh, I'll be glad to answer any. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you so much for, for the inputs. Uh, very interesting input, of course. Uh, we do have some questions. And uh, of course, if there are other questions coming in throughout the Q&A session now, I will also forward them to you. So feel free for our audience to still chip in with questions if you have any. Uh, of course, also the, um, the remark here that if you have uh, any further questions to, to Marcus, 
I think you can either also uh, reach out to him afterwards or find more information in the uh, partner and expo session. Um, if you are, as you stated earlier, just on the website, if you have specific um, questions for, for the different um, case studies. But yeah, let's let's uh, chip right in with the questions. Um, so the, the first question that we actually got was, uh, is Raincode's cloud solutions um, compatible with any cloud providers? Okay, so um, yes, the short answer is yes, because uh, as I mentioned, uh, really the, the core technology that we the core technologies that, that we rely on uh, to to move the mainframe to cloud native environments are, are open standards, industry standards. So we have uh, .NET Core, which is an open standard. It's open source, so you can uh, have .NET Core execution runtimes on Linux, on Windows, and so forth. So you can run it on basically anything, and our compilers target that uh, environment. And then we rely on Docker containers. So Docker in itself is proprietary, but the underlying uh, OCI container standard is open. So you have other runtimes available as well. And Kubernetes is also an open uh, industry standard. So um, in essence, it works on any platform that can provide you with these runtimes. So um, it, it can work on any cloud. We, we, obviously we work with Azure because we're a Microsoft Gold partner. So it's kind of a natural fit for us to start there. Uh, but nothing uh, limits you from using this on uh, on Amazon or on Alibaba or, or whatever. So any cloud provider uh, act will actually work. And actually, the Dapper thing that I mentioned earlier, so the, the tool that we use for Microsoft, it is also open. In the sense, it doesn't just target Azure. It can work with other cloud providers as well. So it doesn't preclude you from using other providers. Thank you. Um, the, the, the second question that we got is, uh, how are you handling the authentication? Um, well, I'm just reading out. So I have seen COBOL information system with authentication and program data access protection, depending of the user's realm of the user, uh, the data is uh, filtered. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the short answer is we don't really manage that. Let me be clear. That doesn't mean we don't care about security. But what I mean by this is that when you actually move your application to a cloud native platform, um, you actually have to design a security solution on the cloud platform itself. And this will usually be based on, uh, for example, uh, it can be based on OAuth tokens. It can be based on Active Directory, for example. Uh, so you will have to actually think about how to migrate the security system uh, from your application, the mainframe ecosystem, to uh, this new cloud native uh, environment. There, there's not a one size fits all solution to that. And that's really something that needs to be discussed with uh, cloud providers uh, and their own architects because there are several solutions available here. Uh, but as, as I want to make sure uh, it's understood in the microservice realm and, and this whole cloud native realm, there are lots of solutions to security, uh, authentication and authorization. Uh, we just need to choose one uh, and implement it. And obviously you're gonna to have to map those onto your applications, but there are solutions to do so. But we, 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 we don't do, we, we just compile the business logic and make it available on the cloud. The, the, the security infrastructure itself is actually uh, something that the cloud providers themselves have to uh, implement and integrate. Yeah, uh, very well. Um, the, the next question that we also got uh, is, uh, how are you handling your distributed transactions? Okay, so uh, it's a very good question as well. So uh, the kick simulator that I showed earlier uh, actually implements, emulates this whole transaction processing by itself. Okay, so it's an, emula it's an emulated uh, environment and it does exactly what the mainframe does. However, uh, the cloud demo that I showed doesn't actually rely on the Kix simulator. So this relies on the uh, Raincode Kix runtime, um, which um, in essence allows us to map Kix verbs directly into .NET logic, okay? So for example, if we have um, exec Kix SQL uh, commands that execute a SQL, uh, uh, transaction within this Kix environment, it, it will do so in an emulator-less manner. So the Raincode runtime is going to, to do this at runtime. It's going to intercept these uh, Kix calls and uh, execute them. And in fact, uh, what Raincode also provides is the opportunity that you can implement and override the way that this emulator-less Kix runtime works, uh, which means that you can 
add logic to uh, to the way our Kix runtime works. Uh, for example, to add a specific uh, transaction management and uh, and the like. So, uh, but really, the idea that we have, and this is a fundamental fundamental assumption uh, that we have here, and that's actually the case in this demo as well, is that most of the time, uh, Kix uh, transactions, as we've seen, for example, the balance transaction, the payment transaction, are actually mostly stateless uh, in the sense that you can you can start them, they, they will execute their code, they will do something on a database, commit, roll back, uh, and actually, um, uh, yeah, do their work and end, and you don't need to keep any state. And this is true for uh, many uh, a Kix transaction. Um, and this basically makes that this very lightweight uh, emulatorless runtime environment uh, allows us to work uh, with lots of these applications without any problems. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. And the, the the last question that we got. Oh no, actually, there's another one coming in. Oh yeah. no, <laughs> just also uh, thank you from from the question uh, from the person who who uh, asked the question. So that's fine. Okay. Um, so the, the last question then that we got was um, just specifically about um, the ring code inside. What specific information does it provide? Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I just mentioned this uh, ring code inside. So it, it's it's a whole uh, topic of conversation as well. So I'm just gonna I can just show you quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but basically, so so ring code inside is something that you get on 360 as well. Uh, so what 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 you see here is the content. So it's basically a business intelligence kind of system to kind of drill into what you have in your portfolio. So you can run compiler portfolio and then load it into this uh, reporting system. And we can see that uh, it gives some insights, such as knowing what what's in your portfolio. We can see that we have COBOL code, for example, HLASM PL1. Uh, we can get uh, information regarding. Uh, various calls that we have in uh, in these different programs. We can see that we have static calls, uh, resolved, unresolved. We can get some ID into uh, the SQL dependencies as well. So we can see that we have tables uh, and we can see which programs use them and what the, their dependencies are. So there's a lot of information. I'm not going to go into a lot of details here. Uh, we have a whole, uh, we have a team working on this and it keeps being improved and uh, so this is really something that keeps getting improved every day. But the idea is really that you can use this to drill down. And this helps us assess uh, how much work is needed to actually migrate your own workload from the mainframe to uh, cloud native. So it, it's really what we use as an assessment, as an assessment tool. Well, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, of course, uh, as well uh, this time for, for answering all the questions. Uh, we would be done now with our Q&A session, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you have more questions for, for Marcus, uh, maybe also for, of course, the, the viewers that uh, will see this on demand, um, yeah, perfect. <laughs> you, yeah. you have the information here. You can just either reach out to him directly over the app, or if you want to, you can, of course, also come uh, to me, and I will then uh, hand you over the questions or give you the contacts. Yeah. So, um, so, so obviously you, you have the coordinates to contact me directly and you also have our sales director here, Wilfried Gutzkoven. You have his coordinates. So if you want to get in touch with us for a partnership or uh, anything else or any questions, you just feel free to fire away. And of course, if you uh, immediately want more information, we also have the, the partner page where you can find some more information and I, uh, I assume also a video. Uh, so um, if you want to, if you see more information, I think you're uh, more than, uh, yeah, uh, there's more than enough information uh, within the app, but also within your website. But yeah, thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you very much for your for, for your insights. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank Thanks you. you. Thanks.